Monday, October 9th, Israel increases airstrikes on the Gaza Strip and seals it off from food, fuel, and other supplies in retaliation for a bloody incursion by Hamas militants as the war's death toll rises to nearly 1,600 on both sides. Hamas also escalates, threatening to kill captured Israelis if Israel attacks targeted civilians without warnings. You cannot say nothing justifies killing Israelis and then provide justification for killing Palestinians. People are are not. People are digging through the rubble from a giant earthquake in western Afghanistan where at least 2,000 people were killed. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the longtime environmental lawyer and anti-vaccine activist, launches an independent bid for the White House. Allies of both President Biden and probable challenger Donald Trump have at times questioned whether Kennedy will be a spoiler against their candidate. The United Auto Workers Union says members at Mack Trucks have voted down a tentative five-year contract and begun a strike. The union's already on strike against the big Detroit three automakers. Claudia Golden, a Harvard University professor, awarded the Nobel Economics Prize for research that helps explain why women around the world are less likely than men to work and to earn less money when they do. Out of 93 Nobel Economics winners, Golden is just the third woman to be awarded the prize. And Native Americans are celebrating their histories and cultures with events across the country, marking Indigenous People's Day. The ceremony's dances and speeches come two years after President Biden officially commemorated Indigenous People's Day. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Israel increased its airstrikes on the Gaza Strip and sealed off the Strip from food, fuel, and other supplies today in retaliation for a bloody incursion by Hamas militants as the war's death toll rose to nearly 1,600 on both sides. Hamas escalated the conflict, pledging to kill captured Israelis if Israel attacks civilians in Gaza without warnings. In the war's third day, Israel was still finding bodies from Hamas' stunning weekend attack into southern Israeli towns. Rescue workers found 100 bodies in the tiny farming community of Barry. That's about 10 percent of its population after a long hostage standoff with Palestinian fighters. In Gaza, tens of thousands of Gazans fled their homes as relentless Israeli airstrikes leveled buildings. The Israeli military said it had largely gained control in the south after the attack caught its vaunted military and intelligence apparatus completely off guard and led to fierce battles in its streets for the first time in decades. Hamas and other militants in Gaza say they're holding more than 130 soldiers and civilians captured inside Israel. Israeli tanks and drones were deployed to guard beaches in the Gaza border fence to prevent new incursions. Thousands of Israelis were evacuated from more than a dozen towns near Gaza, and the military summoned 300,000 reservists, a massive mobilization in a short time. The moves, along with Israel's former declaration of war on Sunday, pointed to Israel increasingly shifting to the offensive against Hamas, threatening greater destruction in the densely populated, impoverished Gaza Strip. 
we have only started striking Hamas, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said in a nationally televised address. What we will do to our enemies in the coming days will reverberate with them for generations. As Israeli military brought additional forces near the border, a major question was whether it will launch a ground assault into the tiny Mediterranean coastal territory. The last ground assault was in 2014. Around 900 people, including 73 soldiers, already have been killed in Israel. That's according to media. In Gaza, more than 680 people have been killed, according to authorities there. Israel says hundreds of Hamas fighters are among them. Thousands have been wounded on both sides. Pacifica correspondent Rami Amagari reports from Gaza near a hospital where casualties from the Israeli airstrikes are being treated. Hundreds of Palestinian households who live near Gaza's eastern border have been forced to leave their residential homes after Israel declared a state of war and pledged a complete siege on Gaza, launching rocket strikes, cutting electricity and blocking the entry of food and fuel to the Palestinian territory. Arij Wahdan is a 35-year-old mother of four children from the northeastern Gaza town of Beit Anun. She and her other five sisters and their children are all now staying at their parents' home in the quiet neighborhood of Rimal in the heart of Gaza City. It was a normal day as I was preparing my son for the school after my husband went to work. Surprisingly, we heard loud sound like thunder and saw red and green light overhead. We were scared and managed to flee in small motorcycle car called Tok Tok to my parents' home. My son fell down from the car and he miraculously survived as rockets were falling down nearby. Everywhere we are forced to flee. Even the quiet neighborhood where Wahdan and her sisters stay is no longer a safe shelter for the population of Gaza amidst intensive Israeli air strikes that have killed hundreds of Palestinians. One strike in the southern city of Rafah killed 19 members of the same family. As Israel declared cutting off power supplies provided by Israeli lines and closed all border crossings, Gaza-based health officials warn of a near collapse. Medhad Abbas is general director of hospitals with the health ministry in Gaza. All requirements of operation rooms, emergency rooms, intensive care units and laboratories are needed at once. And of course, essential medications to handle all those number of mass casualties. Since yesterday morning, we have consumed in one day what we usually consume within a month. So we will not bear too much. It, we will certainly collapse soon, especially with the exceeding numbers attending to the hospitals every now and then. The Hamas-run government in Gaza said it designated 26 safe shelters for tens of thousands of displaced residents, mainly at UNRWA-run schools. Israel's newly declared war comes after 1,000 Hamas fighters and members of other factions like Islamic Jihad carried out an unprecedented attack on neighboring Israeli communities, calling it a lax of load in response to escalating provocations by Israel's far-right government, including increased settler violence and ramped up Israeli attacks on the West Bank. The far-right government's announcement of increased settlements that are illegal under international law, far-right Jews breaking into the Al-Aqsa Mosque in occupied East Jerusalem and the continued Israeli blockade of Gaza. These actions have driven Palestine to a state of, of poverty many compare to apartheid. In an audio statement broadcast on the Al-Aqsa Hamas-run TV, leader of Hamas's military wing, Azeldin al-Qassam Muhammad al daif declared the attack on Israel and called for mobilization. Muhammad al daif is speak. Do not kill the elderly and children and remove all that desecration from your land and your sacred shrines. Take up the fight and angels will be fighting along with you. A few hours after, a few hours after a Dave's statement, dozens of captured Israelis, including soldiers, women and children, were seen in Gaza streets Hamas said it will use the hostages, the hostages and prisoner swaps. There are more 
than 1,000 Palestinians. There are, there are more than 1,000 Palestinians indefinitely detained in Israel with no, with no due process or court hearings, some of them children. Salam Amaru, chief for the Hamas government-run media office in Gaza, says the hostages are being treated well. Can you imagine the moment when someone whose beloved son, brother or wife was killed by Israeli shelling suddenly captures a soldier? Definitely there are scenes of bad treatment. They were random, human emotional scenes that are unjustified and rejected by us. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that the ultimate goal for his army's ongoing operations in Gaza is eliminating Hamas once and for all. Talal Abu Darifa, Talal Abu Darifa is a senior leader of the leftist of the leftist Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. He told Pacifica that he that the moral he told Pacifica that the, the he told Pacifica that the morale of resistance fighters is incredibly high. The occupation should be ready for the high price that it will definitely pay this time because the resistance has got great capacity. We will free our prisoners imprisoned in Israel and I believe that our people's right to self-determination is coming soon. The Iran-backed the Iran -backed Lebanese resistance party Hezbollah warns Gaza is not alone. On Sunday, several motor shells were fired from southern, southern Lebanon towards northern Israeli communities. Israel says it shot down nearly all of them. Meanwhile, United States President Joe Biden says that Washington's support to Israel is unwavering and that Israel has a full right to defend itself as it sends a dozen naval ships to aid Israel's war. But Gaza-based political analyst Wissam Afifa says Washington will eventually prevent further escalation in the Middle East. The military choice alone will prove ineffective. I think that Washington is only giving Israel a chance to take revenge, but at the end of the day, Washington will wonder what's next. The U.S. will not accept that the Middle East remains a region of open... It's a region of open conflict, especially as it has supported normalization efforts and mobilization efforts against both China and Russia. It is absolutely in the interest of the U.S. that the Middle East averts a broader conflict. For Pacifica Radio, KPFA, I am Rami al Mirari in Gaza. This evening, Israeli warplanes carried out an intense bombardment of Ramal, a residential and commercial district of central Gaza City, after issuing warnings for residents to evacuate. Amid continuous explosions, the building housing the headquarters of the Palestinian telecommunications company was destroyed. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant ordered a complete siege on Gaza, saying authorities would cut electricity and block the entry of food and fuel. I have ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. There will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals and we act accordingly. Jan Egeland, Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council aid group, warned that Israel's siege would spell utter disaster for Gazans. He told the Associated Press that there is no doubt that collective punishment is in violation of international law. And he said if and when it would lead to wounded children dying in hospitals because of lack of energy, electricity, and supplies, it could amount to war crimes. In response to Israel's aerial attacks, the spokesman of Hamas's armed wing, Abu Obeda, said tonight that the group will kill one Israeli civilian captive any time Israel targets civilians in their homes in Gaza without prior warning. Israel's foreign minister, Eli Cohen, warned Hamas against harming any of the hostages, saying that this war crime will not be forgiven. President Netanyahu appointed a former military commander to manage the hostage and missing persons crisis. Sagar Magani reports. 
As Israel bombards the Gaza Strip, Hamas is threatening the lives of Israeli civilian captives. Militants say they're holding more than 130 Israeli soldiers and civilians and are threatening to kill a civilian anytime Israel targets Gaza civilians in their homes without prior warning. Israel has traditionally been very sensitive to hostage taking. So it's unclear how the presence of hostages change Israeli, changes Israeli calculations. Mideast expert John Alterman at the Center for Strategic and International Studies says Israel essentially has a script for how to take on militants in Gaza. Except for the hostage element. It's unclear how many Americans are being held. The State Department says at least nine U.S. citizens were killed in the weekend attacks. Sagar Magani, Washington. In a brief announcement to the nation, President Biden said the U.S. will stand with Israel, and he sent about a dozen naval ships to the Middle East region in a show of support. Alex Gonzalez reports. The United States stands with Israel. We will not ever fail to have her back. President Joe Biden says the U.S. will send military aid to Israel as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu formally declares war on the Palestinian group Hamas in Gaza. Secretary of State Antony Blinken confirmed that American citizens are among the more than 1,200 killed or taken hostage. I'm Alex Gonzalez for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. President Biden will reportedly address the nation on the situation tomorrow. Meanwhile, prominent U.S. political figures weighed in on the Israel-Hamas conflict today as it entered its third day. Thousands of protesters supporting Israel and others supporting the Palestinian cause held demonstrations in cities across the country. Max Pringle files this report. Demonstrators in Manhattan's Times Square held competing rallies as police set up a cordon between them. Pro-Palestinian groups held demonstrations at the Israeli consulates in Atlanta, Chicago, and in San Francisco, where demonstrators on both sides of the issue came out on Sunday in front of the Israeli consulate. Seth Morrison said the conflict stems from the conditions in the Gaza Strip. Violence won't solve anything. But when our people are oppressed, when they're held in the conditions of Gaza, like they're in prison, how can you blame them? But Jay Conner of San Francisco said the conflict has more to do with the unwillingness of Israel's neighbors to recognize its right to exist. It's abhorrent. It's terrible. There's no reason why anyone who should be out vacationing, having a party, should have to be kidnapped, hostage, raped and murdered and beaten. It's just shocking. And it's the fact that we're still even arguing Jewish um, existence in 2023 is pretty shocking to me. Earlier in the day, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was at a prayer service at Congregation Sheriff Israel in San Francisco to show her support for Israel and the city's Jewish community. Terrorism is about instilling terror, instilling fear, undermining your motivation to fight back, taking away your hope. But that will not happen. Michigan Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib is the only Palestinian American serving in Congress. She said she mourns the loss of Israeli and Palestinian lives in the conflict, but said the path to peace must include lifting the blockade, ending the occupation, and dismantling the apartheid system that creates the suffocating, dehumanizing conditions that can lead to resistance, unquote. Democratic Congresswoman Cori Bush of Missouri also condemned the violence, but she said in a statement, quote, As part of achieving a just and lasting peace, we must do our part to stop this violence and trauma by ending U.S. government support for Israeli military occupation and apartheid, unquote. President Biden said he fully backs Israel in its fight with Hamas. In this moment of tragedy, I want to say to them and to the world and to terrorists everywhere, if the United States stands with Israel, we will not ever fail to have their back. We'll make sure that they have the help their citizens need and they can continue to defend themselves. And Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who was on a diplomatic trip to China with five other lawmakers, took the opportunity to call on China's government to make a more forceful condemnation of Hamas's attack, which it later did. The ongoing events in Israel over the past few days are horrific. I urge you and the Chinese people to stand with the Israeli people 
and condemn these cowardly and vicious attacks. 250 young people gathered at a dance, and the Hamas terrorists took machine guns and shot them all dead. Meanwhile, people on all sides of the conflict say they expect it to be a long and bloody one. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. The United Nations says the strikes on Gaza have displaced more than 123,000 Palestinians. Israel's U.N. Ambassador Shilad Erdin spoke at the United Nations in New York on Sunday before a Security Council meeting on the crisis. This is Israel's 9-11, and Israel will do everything to bring our sons and daughters back home. The international community, and particularly the UN and the Security Council, have a very short memory when it comes to Israel. The terror that we endure quickly becomes a side note. But this time will not be the same. We will not let the world forget the atrocities our country suffered. Palestinian UN Ambassador Riyad Mansour in response. Regrettably, history for some media and politicians start when Israelis are killed. Our people have endured one deadly year after another. We came to the Security Council month after month, warning of the consequences of Israeli impunity and international inaction. Last October, we stated before the Security Council, the Palestinian people will be free one day or another, one way or another. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for an immediate ceasefire and for the release of all captive Israelis. From Feature Story News in New York, I'm William Denslow. Israel says enormous force will be used against Hamas, warning that the response to this weekend's attack has only just begun. Meanwhile, Hamas militants have threatened to kill hostages if Israel conducts airstrikes without warning civilians. More than 800 Israelis have been killed in what the United Nations calls an abhorrent attack. The UN also estimates that over 500 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has once again condemned the attacks by Hamas. Speaking to the media at UN headquarters on Monday, Guterres called for an immediate ceasefire and the release of all yes. hostages. I recognize the legitimate grievances of the Palestinian people, but nothing can justify these acts of terror and the killing, maiming and abduction of civilians. I reiterate my call to immediately cease these attacks and release all hostages. In the face of these unprecedented attacks, Israeli airstrikes have pounded Gaza. I'm deeply alarmed by reports of over 500 Palestinians, including women and children, killed in Gaza and over 3,000 injured. Unfortunately, these numbers are rising by the minute as Israeli operations continue. While I recognize Israel's legitimate security concerns, I also remind Israel that military operations must be conducted in strict accordance with international humanitarian law. More than 2,000 people have been killed and nearly 10,000 injured in the Afghanistan. William Denisler reporting from, from New York. From News in New Pope Francis has expressed his anguish about what is happening in Israel and Gaza, where violence is again causing massive deaths and injury. Charles de Ledesma reports. Speaking to the faithful in St. Peter's Square, the Pope says he's following with apprehension and pain what's happening in Israel, where the violence has exploded even faster, causing hundreds of deaths and injuries. He says he's expressing his closeness to the families of the victims, and he calls for the attacks to stop. He says, let us understand that terrorism and war do not lead to any solution, but only to the death and suffering of many innocent people. Every war is a defeat. I'm Charles Ledesma. 
The European Union today reversed an earlier announcement that it was immediately suspending aid for Palestinian authorities and instead said it would urgently review such assistance in the wake of the attacks on Israel by Hamas. A terse European Commission statement said there will be no suspension of payments for the moment. It came five hours after the EU commissioner said all payments from the development program for Palestinians would be immediately suspended. All projects put under review and all new budget proposals postponed until further notice, he said. But the EU had, ex- the EU had expressed concern that Hamas had been siphoning off funds meant for humanitarian purposes. Rashid Khalidi is a Palestinian-American historian of the Middle East and the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University. He also serves as editor of the Journal of Palestinian Studies. Khalidi spoke with KPFA's Mitch Jezerich on letters and politics today about the Palestinian uprising and the Israeli response. This I, I wrote a book called A Hundred Years' War on Palestine. This is part of A Hundred Years' War on Palestine, um, in which uh, a, a people has been dispossessed. The, the majority of the population of Gaza are refugees from areas of what is today southern Israel, um, into which Hamas fighters erupted yesterday. Um, that context is forgotten. These are not people from nowhere. These are people from the areas in which the settlements and the towns and the villages that are now inhabited by Israelis, but once lived. Um, that's part of the context. It's sort of the return of the repressed. Uh, Israel has tried to brush the Palestinians out of existence, physically and discursively. And uh, what we are now seeing is the re-eruption into everybody's consciousness in a way that is in some ways extremely horrible of people who have been dispossessed and oppressed. In the case of Gaza specifically, we're talking about a a blockade and a siege that has been ongoing since 2006, so for almost 17 years. In the case of the Palestinians, we're talking about an occupation of the West Bank, uh, occupied Arab East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip that's been going on since 1967, the longest military occupation in modern history. And in the case of Palestine as a whole, we're talking about the ethnic cleansing of most of the country back in 1948, which created the very refugees uh, in Gaza that, that are now subject to this horrific bombardment that is ongoing. So it depends on which aspect of that context you want to bring in. If you don't bring it in, it just looks like people killing Israelis. And it's, it, it is certainly that, but it is much, much, much more than that. Who are these people? Where do they come from? What do they say they're doing? Why are they doing it? And, uh, you know, if you blot everything out by saying it's terrorism and it's, Israel is innocent, and these are just... Uh, uh, this, that, that is the only frame within which it can be understood, then you really miss what's going on and, and what is going to go on, because it will not end with the carpet bombing of Gaza, which is ongoing today. It will not end with the killing of several thousand more, heaven forbid, but I'm afraid that will be the number, 7,000 more innocent civilians in Gaza to avenge the hundreds of Israeli civilians who were killed in the last two days. That won't end it. That's not a solution. The only solution is to end the system of apartheid, which treats one set of people under one laws, or no law at all, the law of the jungle, and another set of people have a constitution and a Supreme Court and laws and bypass highways and swimming pools and one of the highest uh, gross domestic products per capita in the entire world. That system cannot continue. It's not just and it's not sustainable, and uh, this is one indication of that fact. The narrative that is not looking at the history behind all of this uh, is one that's dominating, I think, uh, news outlets here in the United States. I just watched several hours of CNN going into our interview right now, and I imagine it's largely the same on the other uh, sort of mainstream American television news shows. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's 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 the uh, the return of the old narrative, which was beginning to be eroded by the extreme right-wing government's actions um, and by several years of people figuring out that the pablum that they had been fed by the mainstream media didn't represent reality, or at least increasing numbers of people. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be a, a, a swing back um, because of the horrific nature of some of the images that are being broadcast um, and of, of the things that have happened. 
But um, I, I, I think that that really represents a view of things that is passé. Uh, this is not a simple case of innocent Israel defending themselves. Israel has been doing things just in the last few years. Uh, which uh, are beginning to come to the consciousness of people. I mean, attempts to take over and, and, and institute Jewish prayer at the most important mosque in Palestine, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, at the, the, the legal annexation uh, 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 of parts of large parts of the West Bank, the expulsion of three sets of villagers from their homes uh, uh, in different parts of the West Bank, the continued siege of Gaza for 17 years. Uh, all of these things are, are, are percolating to the to the surface among at least some people. So the politicians are talking in an alternative reality, and much of the media lives up there with them. But that doesn't represent what's actually happening. And I, I think that I think that that is going to continue to erode, even if there are setbacks uh, as a result of what's happening in the next two days. I, I'm sad to say that I think that the very large number of people who are likely to be killed in Gaza are going to tip the scales back. I mean, the scenes that are going to come out of Gaza are going to be horrific. I was on Democracy Now!, as you mentioned, this morning uh, with Raji Sorani, a friend of mine, a very, very accomplished human rights lawyer who lives about 800 uh, meters away from uh, the, the central building of the Islamic University in Gaza, which was destroyed as he was on air. Um, and that's the, my, my cousin's house is right down the street from Raji's house in Gaza. I have a cousin who doesn't live there anymore. She, that's where her home is. Now. Um, so uh, I think that those images eventually, there's there are very few Western journalists in Gaza. Israel has been very shrewd at keeping them out. Um, uh, those images are going to eventually come into the balance. And once again, uh, sadly, uh, the, 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 the thousands of people who are, uh, I, I'm afraid, going to be killed in Gaza uh, will, will tip the balance back, perhaps. Rashid Khalidi is the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University, author of the book The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917 to 2017. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock with a half-hour edition at the same hour on the weekends. I'm Mark Miracle. At least 2,000 people have died in Afghanistan after the deadliest earthquake to hit the country in more than two decades flattened entire villages in the western Herat province. Saturday's 6.3 earthquake was also followed by almost equally strong aftershocks. The quake trapped hundreds of people. People have been digging with their bare hands and shovels to pull victims out from under the rubble. A statement from the Taliban said its officials will visit the affected region to provide aid. But because of the Taliban's pariah status, because of its crackdown on women's rights, much aid and Western support has been halted. That will likely make the looming humanitarian crisis unfolding there even worse. Charles de la Zazima reports. A Taliban government spokesman says that the powerful earthquakes have killed at least 2,000 people in western Afghanistan. The figures couldn't be independently verified, but if correct, the toll would eclipse the one that hit eastern Afghanistan in June 2022, striking a rugged mountainous area and killing at least 1,000 people. Saturday's magnitude 6.3 quake hit a far more densely populated area near Afghanistan's fourth largest city, Herat, followed by strong aftershocks. Survivor Mulways Khan in Herat province tells the AP as he stands among the rubble of his home, this quake was a very terrible event. Two or three people were martyred from each family. People have been attempting to dig out the dead and injured with their hands, clambering over rocks and debris. I'm Charles de la Desma. More from reporter Niha Punya in India. More than 1,000 houses have either been damaged or destroyed, with most of the mud structures in the country's west collapsing in the 6.3 magnitude quake that struck over the weekend. Emergency teams in Afghanistan say they're racing to pull people out from the rubble, but with communication networks down and many roads to interior regions still inaccessible, rescue workers are struggling to get to the worst hit areas.
Iha Punya reporting from India. Republicans attacked Robert F. Kennedy Jr. today as the longtime environmental lawyer and anti-vaccine activist launched an independent bid for the White House, reflecting growing concerns on the right wing that if the former Democrat now threatens to take votes from former President Donald Trump in 2024. The Republican National Committee and Trump's campaign both took aim at Kennedy's liberal background, while National Democrats stayed silent, as Kennedy insisted in a speech in Philadelphia that he was leaving both political parties behind. Voters should not be deceived by anyone who pretends to have conservative values, said Trump's spokesperson Stephen Chung in a statement. He labeled Kennedy's campaign, quote, nothing more than a vanity project for a liberal Kennedy looking to cash in on his family's name. The response exposes the unknowns that lie in Kennedy's long-anticipated decision to run as an independent. The move's likely to impact the 2024 race, which appears to be heading toward a rematch between Trump and President Joe Biden, but it's still unclear exactly how. Kennedy, a member of one of the most famous political families in Democratic politics, was running a long-shot primary bid and holds better favorability ratings among Republicans than among Democrats. Even Trump just two weeks ago said of Kennedy, I like him a lot. I've known him for a long time. Allies of both Biden and Trump have at times questioned whether Kennedy would be a spoiler against their candidate. Hundreds of supporters had gathered at Philadelphia's Independence Mall holding signs that read, Declare Your Independence and RFK All the Way, were upbeat about Kennedy's decision. An eclectic mix of disillusioned Democrats, Trump voters looking for a change, and political outsiders who say their ideas don't square with any one party, they insisted that Kennedy could unify them all. Julie Walker reports. The crowd started cheering before Robert F. Kennedy Jr. could finish telling them the news. I'm here to declare myself an independent candidate. And that he's leaving the Democratic Party. An independent candidate for president of the United States. In Philadelphia, the environmental lawyer and anti-vaccine activist told the crowd it's time for a new declaration of independence. I haven't made this decision lightly. It's very painful for me to let go of the party of my uncles, my father. RFK Jr. says he sees a path to victory with many not wanting President Biden or former President Trump. I'm Julie Walker. Former Texas Congressman Will Hurd has suspended his Republican presidential bid, abandoning a brief campaign built on criticizing Donald Trump at a time when his party seems even more determined to embrace the former president. Hurd is endorsing Nikki Haley for the Republican nomination. He was the last major candidate to join the already crowded Republican primary field when he announced his run in late July. He leaves the race after failing to gain traction as a pragmatic moderate who pledged to lead the party away from Trump's Make America Great Again movement. He failed to qualify for either of the first two Republican presidential debates. As the 2024 election cycle heats up, some in Congress are pressing Meta and X, former Twitter executives, on how they plan to tackle artificial intelligence deception on their platforms. Lisa Dwyer reports. As the 2024 election cycle heats up, some in Congress are pressing Meta and X executives on how they plan to tackle AI deception on their platforms. Deep fakes generated by artificial intelligence are having their moment this year, at least when it comes to making it look or sound like the famous did something that they really did not, such as Tom Hanks hawking a dental plan or Senator Rand Paul sitting on the Capitol steps in a red bathrobe. Those images were fakes. Google was the first big tech company to say it would impose new labels on deceptive AI-generated political ads, which can fake a candidate's voice or actions. Now, Senator Amy Klobuchar and Representative Yvette Clark have sent a letter to the CEOs of Meta and X asking for their response on how they plan to handle AI deception. 
They've asked for a response by October 27th. I'm Lisa Dwyer. The measure used to oust former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy last week is now one of the main points of contention in the battle to replace him. McCarthy came, became the first speaker in the history of the U.S. House of Representatives to be removed from the speakership role after Representative Matt Gates of Florida introduced a motion to remove him last week. The 200-year-old parliamentary rule, known as a motion to vacate, triggers a chamber-wide vote on whether to oust the legislative body's leader. The measure used to oust former House Speaker McCarthy last week is now one of the main points of contention. Alex Gonzalez reports. While Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is urging fellow Republicans in the House to change the rule that a single member can move to vacate the chair. I think it makes the Speaker's job impossible. And the American people expect us to have a functioning government. Florida Republican Matt Gates tells NBC News removing former Speaker Kevin McCarthy would still absolutely be worth it, even if he loses his seat. Some GOP lawmakers are discussing Gates' ejection. I'm Alex Gonzalez for Pacific Network and Public News Service. Republicans have no clear idea who will be the next U.S. House Speaker, leaving an unprecedented power vacuum in Congress, severely limiting America's ability to quickly respond to the crisis in Israel or any other number of other problems at home or abroad. Today, the ousted former Speaker Kevin McCarthy quickly jumped into the void, bitterly criticizing President Joe Biden's administration over the strength of its defense of Israel and positioning himself as a de facto Republican leader, even though his colleagues just toppled him from power. It's not at all clear if McCarthy could seriously make a comeback or if one of the other Republicans seeking the gavel, Steve Scalise of Louisiana or Jim Jordan of Ohio, can be elected speaker as the majority stumbles into infighting. House Republicans are scheduled to meet behind closed doors this evening to try to regain control of their majority ahead of possible speaker votes this week. But neither Scalise, the majority leader, who is the second-ranking Republican in the House, nor Jordan, who is the chair of the Judiciary Committee and is backed by Donald Trump, appears to have the votes needed to secure a majority vote. Sasha Abramsky, a freelance writer based in Sacramento, regular contributor to The Nation magazine and TruthOut.org, assessed the chances of Scalise and Jordan on the Sunday show with Philip Mulderie. Well, the, the, the names that have been pushed forward are Jim Jordan, who Liz Cheney, I think, rightly summed up as being the gravest threat to the Constitution of any speaker in history. He doesn't believe in constitutional government. He was intimately involved in the January 6th events. He refused to cert- vote to certify the Electoral College. I mean, this man believes he talks the talk about constitutional government but if you look at what he does jim jordan is an absolute menace to democracy so you've got jordan as the number one candidate you've got steve steve calise who as you say is on record as saying that he's david duke without the baggage well i don't know about you but to me that's a pretty horrific thing to to say i mean who who compares themselves favorably to a ku klux klan leader well apparently steve scalise does so that's your number two candidate and your number three candidate is donald trump now you know the idea of donald trump in any kind of parliamentary leadership role is complete insanity i mean the man is a circus master leader he works quite well at the front of a crowd he knows how to gin up an audience but the idea that donald trump who isn't even a member of the house of representatives would understand the parliamentary procedure that keeps the house of representatives functioning is an absolute farce so those are your three candidates um if i had a sort of look into my crystal ball and say who do i think will emerge i would guess jim jordan will be the next speaker of the house um the Republican parties lurch towards, let's just say, constitutional insanity. So I think it's quite likely Jim Jordan will emerge as the next speaker. Will he be able to hold his coalition in the in the Congress together? I have my doubts because while he may appease people like Matt Gates, there are going to be a number of moderate um, congressmen in districts that Joe Biden won in 2020 who are going to be absolutely petrified by the impact that Jim Jordan. Um, speakership will have on their chances for re-election. 
freelance journalist and author Sasha Abramsky, whose work has appeared in Atlantic Monthly, New York, The Village Voice, and Rolling Stone. He's also a lecturer at the University of California, Davis. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Teekert from Upfront. When we're running down a story or an idea or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast, we take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA. Some 4,000 United Auto Workers Union members at Mack Trucks are on strike today after voting down a tentative five-year contract agreement that negotiators had reached with the company. Mack Truck is owned by Volvo. The strike comes amid an ongoing UAW strike against the big three U.S. automakers. Jennifer King reports. In a letter to Volvo Trucks, the parent company for Mac, United Auto Workers Union President Sean Fain, says that results of a count on Sunday found 73 percent of workers voted against a tentative five-year contract agreement. Mac Trucks President Stephen Roy says the company is surprised and disappointed that the union chose to strike. The UAW represents about 4,000 Mac workers in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Florida. Leaders had negotiated a 19 percent pay raise over five years and some other benefits. Fain says the company and the union are still too far apart on issues including work schedules, health and safety, pensions, and prescription drug coverage. UAW members remain on strike at over 40 locations affecting the big three automakers and have reported some progress in those negotiations. I'm Jennifer King. Hollywood writers have voted almost unanimously to approve the contract agreement reached by their union leaders that ended the strike after nearly five months. The Writers Guild of America announced today that 99 percent of the more than 8,000 members who cast ballots, voted to ratify the three-year deal. Union leaders reached a tentative agreement with the studios on September 24th. Two days later, their board members voted to approve the agreement and declared the strike over. Actors remain in negotiations to end their own strike, which has been going on for nearly three months now. Their talks with the studios restarted a week ago. California has become the first state to ban the term excited delirium as a cause of death. It's nearly exclusively used by coroners after a person's deadly altercation with police and has been debunked by the medical establishment. Governor Gavin Newsom signed the ban on Sunday. Robert Collins fought for the term to be abandoned. His son, Angelo Quinto, died after four Antioch police officers kneeled on him for several minutes after a 911 mental health call. It's sad that medical terminology has been used to defraud the American people in this way to cover up abuse of power and abuse of force by police officers when it's inconvenient um, to find the actual cause of death. And therefore, it prevents our police departments from, well, from having accountability. The American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and the National Association of Medical Examiners have all rejected the term excited delirium as a cause of death. A 2020 analysis of more than 160 cases of excited delirium death found nearly all but two occurred after the deceased had been restrained by police. California needs to reopen every case where excited delirium has been declared as the cause of death. And with, uh, with that, we begin to look at how corruption has 
infiltrated the system and how deaths have been covered up. That's Robert Collins. His son, Angelo Quinto, died after four Antioch police officers kneeled on him for several minutes in what the coroners ruled death by excited delirium. In an announcement today, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences Secretary General Hans Elgren said the Nobel Economics Prize goes to a U.S. professor for advancing the understanding of the workplace gender gap. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award Sveriges Riksbanks Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel 2023 to Professor Claudia Goldin, Harvard U- University, USA, for having advanced our understanding of women's labor market outcomes. The Harvard University professor won the Nobel Economics Prize for research that helps explain why women around the world are less likely than men to work and then earn less money when they do. Claudia Golden's prize marks a small step toward closing a gender gap among Nobel laureates in economics. Out of 93 previous economic winners, Golden is just the third woman to be awarded the prize and the first woman to be the sole winner in any given year. Leaders of two nonprofits in California have won the 2024 AARP Purpose Prize, which honors people over 50 who are making a difference. Suzanne Potter has that story. The first is Don Schoendorfer from Irvine, who designed a wheelchair that can be distributed easily in developing countries through his nonprofit, Free Wheelchair Mission. The second is Dr. Laura Stachel, an obstetrician from Berkeley who founded We Care Solar after an unnerving experience while conducting medical research in Africa. I was working in a hospital in northern Nigeria in 2008. I was actually helping on a C-section when the lights went out. And I couldn't believe it. We were trying to finish the surgery where there was no light in the room. If we hadn't had a flashlight that I brought with me, there would have been no light to finish. So she founded We Care Solar in 2010 to provide solar electricity to maternal health facilities. Since then, the nonprofit has equipped more than 8,000 clinics in over 20 countries with suitcases equipped with solar power and medical devices. Find out more at aarp.org slash purpose prize or at wecaresolar.org. Stachel says it costs about $3,600 to donate a suitcase, ship and install it, plus train the local health care workers and maintain it at a clinic for five years. The solar suitcase is mounted to a wall inside the health facility and has four medical surgical lights, a fetal Doppler, an infrared thermometer. It has 12-volt DC charging for phones and other devices, and it enables health facilities to work around the clock seven days a week. Purpose Prize winners get a $50,000 donation to their organization and are eligible for another 10000 through the Inspire Award. That competition allows the public to vote for their favorite Purpose Prize winner at aarp.org slash Inspire Award. I'm Suzanne Potter. Many people pause today across the country to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day in the Bay Area Indigenous people and others gathered early this morning on Alcatraz for a sunrise ceremony and later for other events meant to commemorate hundreds of years of survival and resistance. The day began on Alcatraz Island at daybreak where people celebrated the occupation of Alcatraz by indigenous activists in the late 1960s and early 70s to call attention to the mistreatment of Native people. George Galvis is the co-founder and executive director of the group Communities United for Restorative Youth Justice. He said the reservation system across America is a remnant of the process of colonialization of Native people in the United States. What many people refer to as homelands, those reservations, those are prisoner of war camps by definition in federal Indian law. And the very first prisons in the context 
of the so-called United States were the reservation and the slave plantation. At an event this afternoon at Yerba Buena Gardens in San Francisco, hundreds of people gathered to watch traditional indigenous dances and listen to music. Kina Silver River Fassett is an indigenous person who came from Placerville for the celebration. She said Indigenous Peoples Day celebrations can be a good time to remember that all peoples and all cultures have value. It doesn't matter what tribe or what nation or what race you're from, we all live on this planet and we all need to respect Mother in the best way that we can possible for all the children that are coming up in this world. We need to start treating each other like brothers and sisters and come together as a people, as a human race, to save and protect this earth. During the event, some people spoke about the importance of recognizing and valuing indigenous cultures. Lakota Hardin, member of the International Indian Treaty Council. That I have a blessed gift that I'm able to speak. I, I meet people all the time who tell me they're terrified to talk, and that's where I come alive. <laughs> Put a mic in my hand and I feel like, because it doesn't come from me. It's my, my offerings I make each day. It's my relationship with this earth, these trees. Every time I come here, the first thing I do is reach out to these trees and that water that's running over there and say thank you to them. You know, and this oxygen, like I said earlier and, and when I was speaking, you make that relationship, you acknowledge them, and they'll take care of you, you know. So they take care of me, and I, it's not coming from me necessarily, the words. Lauren Kirby said Indigenous Peoples Day is a great time to teach and to learn about Indigenous traditions. This day is celebrated as Indigenous People Day, but I think it's important to note that every day is Indigenous Peoples Day. I think... Uh, People should learn more about indigenous people, our history, our culture, our traditions. And I think, uh, you know, if there's a celebration near you, I would suggest going to it if it's, if it's open and if it's public. The first Indigenous Peoples Day was held in 1992 in opposition to the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus' arrival in the so-called New World. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill over the weekend that requires large businesses in California to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions and what their plan is to deal with it. It's the most sweeping mandate of its kind in the country. The law requires more than 5,300 companies that operate in California and make more than $1 billion a year in annual revenues to report both their direct and their indirect emissions. That includes things like emissions from operating a building or a store, as well as those from activities like employee business travel and transporting their products. Backers of SB 253 say it will bring about more transparency to the public about how big businesses contribute to climate change, and it could nudge them to evaluate how they can reduce their Greenhouse gas emissions, they argue many businesses already disclose some of their emissions <clears throat> to the state. However, the California Chamber of Congress, commerce that is, agricultural groups and oil companies that oppose the law say it will create new mandates for companies that don't have the experience or the expertise to accurately report their indirect emissions they also say it's too soon to implement the requirements at a time when the federal government is weighing emissions disclosure rules for public companies. Slight chance of rain tonight in the San Francisco Bay Area. Tomorrow, partly cloudy with highs in the mid-60s. Partly cloudy further inland with highs in the low 70s. Sunny tomorrow in the central San Joaquin Valley with a high of 80 degrees. That is it for the news tonight for this Monday, October 9th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Tune in Monday nights on KPFA and KPFA.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. 
That's Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Thank you.